Thanks, Craig. Well, Craig was not wrong when he said I was a bit nervous, but maybe it's just a senior moment that I was having. Now, I'm really pleased to be here, even though those lights are shining directly in my eyes, to discuss with you the National Paddock Survey Project. And the GRDC started this project in 2014, so we've got four years of data to discuss this morning. And it has been a, a fantastic project. There's been a lot of learnings in it to try and work out exactly what are the causes of the yield gap. And while Craig was speaking, I was looking around the audience and I think nearly everyone here, or actually everyone here, is working towards minimising and reducing the yield gap that is actually occurring on farms. So whether you're working as an agro, where you've got a direct input to what's actually happening on the farm, you could be a fertiliser reseller, working in nutrition, or even working in the social sciences, in practice change, and or in communication where you're preparing information to go out to farmers. So as an industry, we're all really interested in reducing the yield gap. Now, but we have got to set a, a few benchmarks on what the yield gap is actually about. And it is certainly about better, better agronomy and trying to negate the effects of the declining terms of trade, as Craig also discussed. But there is a limit to how much carbon dioxide and water we actually can push through a plant to produce yield. So there is a yield ceiling, and that ceiling is slightly changing every year with better cultivars, but ultimately there is an upper limit to what we're going to be able to produce. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Now, it is, I was the project manager for this project, and I'm dealing directly with the consultants and some of the farming systems groups who are doing all the monitoring in the project. And um, Roger Laws, he from CSIRO, he's responsible for doing the statistical analysis at the end of the project. So he'll be starting that very soon. So Roger is going to be defining and analysing the millions of data points that we've collected over the last four years and coming up with a regional as well as a national um, drivers behind the yield gap and what we can actually do about it. So just to come to a common understanding of what the yield gap is, it is essentially about the difference between potential yield and the actual yield and we need to define what the potential yield is. So the potential yield of a crop is worked out from, now there's a couple of ways of doing that, but we use simulation modelling to do that. And I'll explain that a bit more as we're going through the project. And the actual yield of the, of the crop was defined from um, yield maps in the paddock over the four years. So we've got a very good understanding of what actually happened in the paddock. There was a lot of monitoring and we got a very close to being able to work out what the potential yield is. Now this morning I'm going to focus on the South Australian results and remember that Roger is going to do the statistical analysis so he's going to be able to do cause and effect studies whereas I'm going to talk about what ha actually happened within the paddock and what the results were for the people I was working with. So on, in the um, York Peninsula, we worked with Stephen Smith and Bill Long. In the Mid-North, we worked with Mick Faulkner and Jeff Brun. And in the Mallee, we worked with Michael Moody from MSF. And they were the consultants who were collecting all the data. Well, just go back one step. So before I mention that there is an upper limit to production, and we've got it discuss this a little bit in more detail because we need to work out what the potential yield is before we can actually work out what the actual yield is. So before I mentioned that carbon dioxide and water are obviously really important, but also the, photo peer, the uh, photothermal equation, which is the difference between, or which is the relationship between solar radiation and um, temperature, is a critical factor and that actually sets the theoretical potential. So if we have a look at a, this line, it's the Rawson line, which is the relationship between grain yield and the photothermal quotient. 
and as you can see up here, up at the other level, up the up, up sorry, at the top end of the equation, in the South Island of um, New Zealand, long daylight hours, relatively cool temperatures, very high potential for yield. We're going down further. If we're going down towards Queensland, much hotter, shorter daylight hours and much lower grain yield potential. Now, interestingly, there's a couple of points on the graph there. So John Kierkegaard grew some crops in the trial in 2013 that yielded, yielded close to 13 tonne to the hectare just near Canberra. So it is doable. And in our project, I had a crop potential yield as worked out from simulation yield from simulation modeling that was going to go somewhere around 10 ton and I asked John to check whether that was actually feasible for our environment and it came back that it certainly was now that crop didn't achieve that yield but the potential through the simulation modeling was in that order now when I'm talking about the potential yield there's the first instance is this yield, which is radiation and temperature. You can see that is the optimum that that plant can achieve. Now, especially in Australia, in our growing conditions, we've got a lot of soil difficulties, subsoil limitations, and water uptake is never easy, and quite often we get extensive water logging as well. So a limiting factor for us is water availability. It's not just rainfall, it's water availability because of these subsoil limitations. And then when we look at that in the next step is what are the reducing factors that, we, that are experienced on the farm, such as nutrients, frost, weeds, diseases, insects, and sowing date all play a role, and you can sure that you can name many others, and that is the actual component of the project that we focused on. So we were focusing us on, on this part of working out how much of these factors were influencing the potential yield or the actual yield on the farm, taking into account that this is the optimum. Now how did we, act, how did we do that? So we used APSIM, which is a simulation model developed by CSIRO, and APSIM works on a daily time step, so it grows the crops from the time of sowing right through until harvest on a daily time step. So rainfall is critical to put in, daily rainfall. The soil classification is really important, primarily because of this subsoil limitation issues. We do soil testing prior to the seeding, prior to seeding for soil nitrate as well as soil water, so we know what we're starting with. We need climate data for the radiation and, and other factors involved. We need the crop details because of the cultivar as well as the sowing date. And then ultimately we also need the amount of fertilizer that's been applied in terms of nitrogen. So that's the theory behind how APSOM operates. And then the outputs are what determines the size of the yield gap. So we start off with the actual yield in the paddock or the zone that we were monitoring and then with the simulations we run two types of simulations. The first simulation is where we have a nitrogen unlimited simulation. So water limited, so it becomes YW, but nitrogen unlimited. So every time on the daily time step the model runs, if it gets below a certain level of um, available nitrogen in the subsoil, then extra nitrogen is applied through the modelling. And so the yield is only limited from that previous slide by temperature solar radiation as well as the amount of carbon dioxide that is in the air. And that has changed overall if you compare what happened 10 years ago to now. There's a slight change in the potential yield. So the yield gap is defined as the difference between the actual yield and the simulated nitrogen unlimited yield. But we also run another simulation which is run with exactly the same conditions as the crop was grown. So it is nitrogen limited and water limited and we call that Y sim for just the simulated yield. So exactly the same conditions as the actual yield 
but there is a gap between the simulated yield and the nitrogen unlimited yield and that can only be the amount of nitrogen that is added to get to the YW yield. And the yield difference between the simulated and the actual yield are the limiting factors or the defining factors that actually reduce the yield such as weeds and frost and diseases and everything else. So this project was looking at in the first instance, how much nitrogen was missing from the system, and then secondly, what were the main factors that were reducing yield, which in a lot of cases we do and can manage. So how do we determine the yield gap for the study? We had 250 paddocks nationally, and each paddock was divided in two zones, and we undertook monitoring in each in the paddocks right throughout the season. So in 2015, in the first year, we did a quite extensive survey of each of the zones and we looked at the amount of well, soil carbon in the topsoil. We also did cation exchange capacity down the profile. We did particle size analysis, so the amount of clay, sand and silt in the soil. And we did a quite an extensive survey to ensure that the two zones that were identified from previous yield mapping were actually in them, um, that we could define what the soil differences were. So in each paddock, we had two zones. This is zone A. The zone is about, the transect is about 250 metres long. Each of those points is um, GPS referenced. So the consultants and the farming system groups who did the monitoring always went back to that same point year after year after year and zone B is in the highest yielding zone but exactly the same conditions. So there was very specific um, study to look at what the yield gap were in those two zones which were always a high and a low yielding zone. pre sowing every year we did soil nitrate and ammonium, so mineral N down the profile, and soil water and topsoil for predictor B which is for um, soil borne diseases. The consultants and the farmers kept really good crop records because, you know, without sowing date, cultivar and date of application of nitrogen and how much nitrogen was applied, you couldn't possibly do this project. So the crop records were critical. The consultants went out at growth stage 30 to do plant counts. They also assessed the amount of disease in the crop at growth stage 30 as well as in, at growth stage 65, so flowering. And the root samples were sent off to Gupta for analysis and stubble samples were sent off to Stephen Simfendorfer for fusarium content. And like I said, the consultants also looked at weeds and insects. Um, most of our paddocks had tiny tag buttons in them for temperature, for frost analysis, and data entry was all via website and Yield maps were an essential component of this project because without a yield map we got an average paddock yield but we, didn't, we would not necessarily have the zone yield and that was pretty important. Now we were nowhere near 100% in yield maps because stuff happens on the farm and sometimes there are contractors coming in and everything else or headaches get burnt. And, but we have well over half the paddocks have got a four year yield map. Okay, so now we're going to have a look at the York Peninsula first. So these are the type of results that are coming out of this project where we're running the simulation model on an annual basis as well as on a continuous basis because we want to see what's happening over the rotation. So for example, on this paddock with Stefan in, on the York Peninsula, the crop was in wheat in 2014, so that was the setup year and the first year of the project was 2015 and once again the paddock was in wheat. So what happened in that particular year? Now remember from my explanation before that the difference between YW and YSIM and YW is in the green and YSIM is in the middle bar which is in orange, that difference can only be nitrogen because that's the only difference in the simulations between the whole setup between those two simulations one has got unlimited nitrogen and one has got the farm applied nitrogen. So there is a loss in yield 
in that year of close to, well, a bit over two tonne to the hectare because insufficient nitrogen was applied. However, there's also a gap between the actual yield, so that's the lighter yellow, and the orange, which is the simulated yield. And if you remember from before, that difference can only be attributed to the abiotic or biotic factors that are influencing that crop. So in 2015, we had two frost events down to minus two during growth stage 60 to growth stage 79. So during that critical flowering and grain setting period, we had one heat shock event over 34. Fusarium was at high levels from the predictor B test. Gupta's analysis showed there was a moderate level of disease on the roots and the stubble also had fusarium at moderate levels and there were quite a few snails in the paddock. So that gives you a snapshot of what sort of limiting factors were occurring in that particular paddock in 2015 to actually cause that result, to cause that decline. Now, it wasn't my job in the project to do the statistical analysis, and I said before, Roger Lewis from CSIRO is doing that, so he's going to put actual figures on these factors on how much they contributed in terms of the yield gap for that particular year on that particular farm. In 2017, which was obviously a great year with just over six tonne in actual yield, and the um, nitrogen unlimited yield is roughly the same. So in that year, there was no yield gap. So there was a sufficient nitrogen and there were no abiotic stresses or biotic stresses on that crop. We did have a, a um, two-day heat event, but was at a, at a lower temperature than the one above. And there was some diseases left in the crop, but they weren't at a very high level. And once again, Roger will do the stats on that kind of data. So the average yield gap for that 2015 was 57% and 2017 only 8%. Now, unfortunately, APSIM is not set up to do to model lentils or chickpeas or faba beans, so there is quite a few crops in the rotation that we can't model. We can model canola, but APSIM isn't very good with the, uh, with the other crop types. Now I'm going to show you two more examples. So this is for the mid-north with Mick and Jeff, where once again the paddock was in wheat in 2014. and 2015, you can see there's no yield gap in that particular year. And when I looked at all the stresses in terms of predictor B or in temperatures, there were no frost or heat shock events, and there were very low level of diseases and weeds and insects in the paddock. 2016, the lentils failed. And in 2017, there was, a, there was a yield gap. It wasn't due to nitrogen because YSIM and YW are essentially the same. But there was a two ton loss in, in yield between YA and YW. And I've listed here the factors that are contributing to that. So once again, there was quite a severe period of frost and heat. And predictor B had high level of disease coming out moderate disease levels on the roots, and, but very high levels of pratolancus, and fusarium was low in this case, and there was a little bit of ryegrass. Now, effectively, in most of the paddocks that we looked at, weeds were rarely an issue. I mean, there were a couple of places where they were, but in most of the paddocks, the 250 paddocks nationally that we looked at, weeds weren't a big problem. Now, and I guess we are biasing the average result because in most areas there, is, um, there are still a lot of paddocks with weeds, but probably not, a, not overall. We've got the Mallee. So this is Michael Moody. 14 was wheat, 2015 was barley, no yield gap. 2016, a very big yield gap for the Mallee, and that is primarily due to a lack of nitrogen in that year. Now, we all know what 2016 was like. It was very late rain, and there were farmers that took the opportunity to put out more nitrogen in late August, early September, but a lot of farmers didn't because they were unsure about the season, and they obviously missed that year in relation to applying, applying in. 
was vetch hay in that year and 2018, very poor crop. So that gives you an, an overview of what's actually happening overall. Now, I just want to mention, before we go to the next slide, that you probably remember that Svee Hockman published a paper four or five years ago where he said that the average of the yield gap across the Australian grains industry is 50%. And the results that I've been showing you is that it's much more likely to be somewhere around 20%, maybe 25%. Now, so we looked at the average for the whole of the grains industry. And when I first saw that, I thought, well, that can't be right because I know very few farmers that are producing that low yields in relation to the yield gap. Now, last week I was on a speaking tour and I drove from Sea Lake down to Horsham and you may have heard that the Southern Mallee had 240 mil of rain last year in, in December, and which was double the growing season rainfall for that year. And when I was driving south, I was amazed about the paddocks with heliotrope. More than half of the paddocks were completely blue and which actually means that most of that water that potentially was stored for production has been transpired through the, through the, um, um, through the weeds in the paddocks, through the heliotrope. So maybe that average that SVE has actually come up with is not that far wrong. And why farmers don't treat the heliotrope, I have no idea. I mean, the BCG have been working on that for years, but the, in fact, the yield gap could easily be much more than 20% because the clients that we're working with, the farmers we're working with, would certainly be controlling heliotrope and everything else. So we're looking at average is not the same as what's happening on these farms. Now, when we attribute cause and effect for the York Peninsula, 34 zones were monitored over the four, over the four years. There was no gap in half of them, and nitrogen was limiting on 12 of the zones out of the 34, and there were other reasons such as frost on seven, and similarly for the mid-north and the Mallee. Now, there is a big difference in the mid-north compared with the Mallee and the <coughs> York Peninsula, and that is primarily due to nitrogen. So there's a lot more focus in the mid-north on N than there is on the York Peninsula and in the Mallee. How much longer? Okay. Now, a, little, a few other things that can come out of this project is because we got the data, we can analyze it for mineral nitrogen, for, for mineralization of nitrogen. And just very briefly, after lentils on the York Peninsula, it got close to 200 kilograms of N available, after canola 140, and after cereal 120. So that gives you some, some help in relation to setting nitrogen rates if you have this kind of data. So where to from here? Well, we have the tools available for us to assess yield gap analysis. We've got APSOM, which is a fantastic model and um, really useful for doing that. Um, <clears throat> as the yield gap shrinks, it's going to be more and more difficult. We need to develop a plan to manage risk because financials are really important if we're closing the yield gap, we're pushing the limit. And don't forget that your feet in the ground are always going to be the most important. Now, before Craig shuts me down, I just want to mention a couple of things on water use efficiency because I know that a lot of people are using water, fish, water use efficiency as a benchmark for setting target yields. And I'm a little bit concerned about that. But like most people, when I first heard Rich French talk about this in the late 80s, I was gobsmacked because it gave us a target and we never had a target before. So this is Red French's line, this is Victor Sadras and Angus line, and this is Sadras and Lawson's line. So things have improved over the time, but you can see there's a still a huge distribution of the um, paddocks that are not reaching their potential yield. Now I just want to show you two examples before I finish. This red square was a paddock that had an actual yield of 4.9 tonne and a water nitrogen unlimited, water limited yield of 5.2 tonne. 
Now, that is through the simulated results, and that soil has got severe subsoil limitations, and it's never going to achieve the water use efficiency of the French and Schultz line, or even or the Sadras and Angus line. So that gap here, between here and the black line, is always going to be happening on that paddock, and it doesn't matter how much nitrogen you put onto that paddock, it's never going to achieve it, because the subsoil limitations are actually limiting the uptake of water. Whereas this point has got a actual yield of 7.5 tonne in, that, in, a particular, in one of the four years, over the, over the last four years, sorry, and a water limited, nitrogen unlimited yield of 7.4, which is very close to the French and Schultz line. So actually using water use efficiency as a guide to setting nitrogen rates or even optimum yield, I find very concerning because I, don't, I think the tool is too much of a sledgehammer to be able to do that. And the only thing that we can actually, that we can do is use simulation modeling. And there is a lot of opportunity to keep advancing that technology. Thank you. So thank you, Harm. I think that gives us a, a couple of, or a snapshot of some of the paddocks on the York Peninsula. Um, just before we throw open, open to questions, can you maybe just give the audience a bit of an idea for the scale of the number of data points that have been collected as part of this investment? Well, so Craig asked me that before, if we include the temperature data, so that's measured every three hours, so there is well over two million data points in the data set. But the actual monitoring data was very, very intensive. I mean, the consultants, when they signed on, and I probably didn't know, quite know that as well, they probably signed on for a lot more than what we expected. So there was a lot of monitoring out in the paddock. There were at least four visits annually to the paddock. And I must say, I've learned a lot about my own profession. And there are consultants and there are other consultants. And but luckily in the southern region, and I don't say this lightly, and I will say the same when I go to the west, well, the west would be quite a different story, but there are, in the, in the south, we had a very good response to getting nearly 100% of the data points entered. Okay, we'll throw it open <laughs> to questions. If you